This is an overview of the chapter one reading. Um, I'm excited to make this video uh, in order to quickly go over some of the concepts in the chapter one reading because we are losing a lecture. And so uh, I, I thought it might be useful to some people to hear me just briefly uh, touch on some of these things. A lot of this we've uh, done in class. We've already read the chapter. But this is just a chance for me to talk about a little bit of it. Um, and uh, it, it could also prompt questions uh, when you see the video. So if you do have questions, just bring them to me. I'll be skipping through some of this stuff. So, um, but it might remind you that you, uh, that you have a question. So if you do, hang on to those. Ask them to me in class or after class or in office hours or in email. Okay. So this is about why, pro why we program, uh, what the structure of a program is, what the parts of a program are and um, something about object-oriented programming as well. So uh, we've discussed why to program. You're very familiar with programs and uh, and what they do. So the purpose of programs is familiar. But um, in this class, one of the things that we learn and discuss, one of our objectives, is to understand that there is a logical flow to the instructions. So we talk about algorithms, for example. We, um, we also talk about the logic of programs, the procedures that uh, accomplish the mathematics in a program. Uh, and we learn about the structure of, of the programs, the layout of the programming statements in the program, how to, how to understand when we see a program, and um, how to create our own structures that other programmers will understand. Uh, we learn about the tools of programming, like the IDE, Eclipse, that we're using in this uh, class. We learn about how to create a uh, piece of software that will be friendly for um, people to use. In other words, that will be um, understandable to users and make sense to them and accomplish the tasks that they need done. So there are a lot of purposes of programs and there's a lot that we learn that goes into, um, into how we do programming. There is a concept of the correctness of programs. So um, there are a number of ways that we verify this correctness. And some of our, uh, the, some of the ways of programming that we learn, and some of the, the processes that we engage in, um, some of the practices that we take on as programmers help us to be, to create more correct programs um, and uh, make programs that are easier to maintain and easier to keep correct over the lifetime of the software project. I'm skipping over hardware and the CPU. Uh, main memory has come up a, a couple of times in class already. Um, that is the volatile memory, the RAM, as it's referred to when you're buying a computer often. Uh, any th program that's currently running is stored in there. All the data that is used by those programs stored. So the program itself is stored in RAM and um, the data as well. Uh, we've talked about bytes, which is how bits are grouped. Those one, off, those, uh, one or zero values, those on off values uh, that are stored that help a computer um, store data and accomplish um, arithmetic, logic, things like that. Main memory only works while the computer is on, and so that we have so we have a secondary storage mechanism or several secondary storage mechanisms that allow data to persist when the computer is off. We've got disk drives that we store um, our data on. Solid state drives are also uh, much faster than disk drives, um, but slower than main memory. Those are things like um, flash drives, USB drives. We have optical devices. CD and DVD drives are also slow, but other forms of long-term storage for various purposes. We have to get our data into the computer somehow, and that is usually accomplished by uh, devices that the user interacts with. So input devices like keyboard, mouse, scanner, digital camera are ones that you've probably already used so that you're familiar with. There are output devices as well, like printers and monitors. 
there's two types of software we talked about operating system software and application software and I'm skipping over those um, because we've already discussed them but the operating system allows the computer to function and allows all of the input and output devices um, to function because it contains low-level code that uh, interprets for instance key presses and makes it into something that you can use in a program so uh, there's also application software that then takes the things like key presses once they are recognized by your operating system software and allows you to access those key presses and do something with them that's of use to the user. Okay, I'm skipping over what is a program and the history of Java is interesting but I would encourage you to look at it in the chapter. It's not going to be part of this video. There are two types of Java structures that um, accomplish tasks for uh, people. Applications, which are programs like system applications that you're familiar with, they stand alone. And then applets are things that run in web browsers. You may have seen Java applets before. They're usually embedded in a page and um, they can be useful for delivering uh, processing on the internet, although JavaScript is a lot more uh, popular for that purpose nowadays. Okay, I'm going to skip over what a program is made of to talk a little bit about the compiler and the virtual machine, which is much more, which, is going to, which are going to be uh, very important to you now that you're doing labs. So, you've all, as you've already seen, source code is put into .java files, and um, we need a tool to take that human readable Java file that has program that has programming code in it and we need to something that takes that file and turns it into a machine usable form and the tool that does that is known as the compiler there's a compiler built into our IDE built into Eclipse there's also a text editor that allows the programmer to actually create the Java file. So these things work together. The text editor and the compiler are part of the IDE um, that will create machine usable, help you create a create the machine usable program. So the compiler part of that equation is run using the source code file as input and what it creates is something else, a, another an internal representation of the code that's known as bytecode that the that another program called an interpreter uses to actually run a program and it's the Java virtual machine that is the name of the interpreter that runs compiled Java programs okay and the nice thing about the Java virtual machine is that it, there are versions that run on uh, Windows and on Macs and on Linux machines and on phones and on other devices so once you write and compile a Java program to bytecode it can run in many different places and, um, and that's was that's always been an advantage of Java because um, years ago before Java was created most languages ran, uh, once they were compiled, they were compiled to only run on one platform, on one machine, one type of machine. Um, so that's an advantage of Java. Once it's compiled, it runs on many different machines. Of course, since then, we've had, uh, we've had many different types of languages that run on, on uh, different machines. Python is run on many different machines. Uh, so JavaScript, of course, runs in browsers. So this advantage of Java is not uh, unique, but it is an advantage. Okay. So we call the JVM an interpreter because it interprets the previously compiled bytecode. You will never see bytecode, but it's what the compiler turns your program into so that it can be interpreted as a program. Okay. Okay, when we compile and run a Java program, it's all done within the IDE, which is something I will um, discuss in class. And uh, 
you're already you've already seen an example of IDE, an IDE eclipse in uh, in your lab, and as you've seen, there are different windows that hold parts of the uh, parts of the development environment. But I'm going to skip right now to uh, a description of object-oriented programming because we haven't really discussed this in class yet. So the older method of writing programs used a paradigm that was called procedural. A procedure is, a, is really very close to an algorithm. It's a set of language statements that perform a task, basically an algorithm. And our old method of writing programs was centered on creating algorithms. So it didn't really, uh, it used data, but um, in a way, in the paradigm itself, data was an afterthought. It was just, data was something that the procedures acted on. Okay, so here's kind of an example. So you've got a procedure, um, it takes a data item, passes it to another procedure. Okay, and um, if this seems strange, Passing data around is something that happens in all uh, programming languages. So the use of data is very important to um, all of the functioning that computers do. But this is a representation that just shows you that for procedure B to have the data it needs, in this case, it's relying on procedure A sending it the data. So in that procedural programming approach, there's this kind of separation of data and data is just seems like something that gets passed around. Okay. In contrast to that, object-oriented programming is a system in which the parts of a program, the classes, um, are designed to create objects that that marry data and uh, procedures into one unit because the functionality of the program depends on those procedures and that data working together. So these things are melded together because their meaning inside of the use of the program um, is coupled. So we have other words that we use for some of the data attributes for uh, data. Procedures in an object-oriented world are called methods. So you'll hear attributes I may say fields or things like that, but attributes and methods are the data and the procedure procedures of an object-oriented uh, program. Okay, so the so why is this important? Why is it important that in an object-oriented program, the data or attributes are coupled with the uh, with the methods? Well, it's important because the data and the methods together have meaning. For instance, if you have a program that's uh, that's processing, say, a list of students, okay, you, your program is keeping track of students that are enrolled in a class. So it's a, a class enrollment example a program. It the the list of names of students are really useless unless they are coupled with the methods that allow you to manipulate those names or retrieve those names or and do all sorts of things. So the, the, the names really are just stored as strings, uh, string variables. And a string variable alone is not necessarily, doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense on its own, but if you see a string variable that's a name that's one of many names that is being kept track of as part of an enrollment in a class, then it makes sense when you group those together, as soon as you see these strings, you know that they're part of this process of keeping track of who's enrolled in the class. Um, there are probably better examples, but um, essentially the data and the methods are more meaningful and more understandable when they become part of a unit, a unit that works together. Also, when you're accomplishing a task in Java, along the way you may use data that's not important for 
other parts of the program to see. Okay, so for instance, if you're counting up how many students are in the class using a program, and you use that for the purpose of doing something with the program, but you don't want anybody outside of the of that class to actually see that number of students, then you would store that number only internally to your um, Java class. Okay, it may be very important. Uh, Mary, the count may be very important to to manipulating the class of students. However, you just may not be interested in showing it to other people. Plus, you may not want anybody to mess with that count. For instance, you don't want someone adding one to that count or subtracting one from the count. You want your class to be the only, uh, the only part of the program that has methods that manipulate that count. Why? Well, because if you're keeping, if you have a specific way of keeping track of the number of students in the class, you don't want someone from the outside saying, oh, I'm just going to add one to that number, because then that number might be incorrect. Okay, And this is why grouping data and functions together is important. This aspect of data hiding is important, because one of the things it allows us to do is to have the methods that the programmer wrote to modify the data they can be the only methods that are allowed to modify that data. Okay? And if they're the only methods that are allowed to modify that data, then the person who created that part of the program can ensure that at least it works without interference from the outside. And that's the principle of using data hiding to help make uh, parts of a program more correct. Also, when these objects that are created by classes, when you create a class that is a self-contained component that acts on, that has methods that act on data, these self-contained components might be a lot easier to be reused. For instance, if you create a class that keeps track of inventory in a shop, uh, that class may be uh, perfect for a program that manages a shop, but it also may be perfect for a program that manages some other type of business, okay, a warehouse or something like that. So you could take that class or set of classes that work as a unit to keep track of stock, and you can take them from, often you'd be able to take them from one program and use them in a completely different program. That's reusability. So when, when software components are written to do a specific job and they work internally and they work well, they can be reused. And encouraging people to write methods that are coupled with data in a system, an object-oriented system like Java classes, encourages people to write reusable code. OK. So this, uh, this set of slides includes an everyday example of an object. Okay, so, and the, that object is a clock. It's meant as a metaphor for you to think about how, um, what, how an object might look in, uh, in, a, in a program if it were a real life object. So for example, imagine a clock. What are the data attributes of a clock? Well, a clock has a current, um, a current second. You know, whatever time it is, there's a number of seconds that indicate the time. There is a number of minutes that indicate the time in a certain hour. So it's if it's five o'clock, if it's 15 minutes past five o'clock and 10 seconds, then the hour might be five. Let's say it's 5 a.m. for example. So 5 for 5 a.m., 15 for 15 minutes past the hour, and then 10 seconds past 15 minutes past the hour. Okay, so this is the, these are the attributes of the clock. This is the data that it stores. So what methods are necessary for a clock? Well, clock's not very useful if you can't use it. So uh, 
one thing that makes a clock useful is it has to be set to accurate time. So there has to be a way to set it. So one uh, type of method that a clock needs is the ability to set the time. So someone outside the clock needs to be able to set it from time to time. Okay. You might also want to set an alarm time. So um, note that if a clock has an alarm time, that implies some different data that that clock is storing. So there is other attributes that you can try to imagine for yourself, like what what data uh, a clock would need if you can set an alarm time as well. Okay. You probably want to be able to get the time as well. So that would be um, a public method. So as has been mentioned in class and in other videos, a public method is a method that is available to the outside world. So here's the this concept of data hiding uh, and a functionality hiding. Public methods are not hidden. Private methods, the third thing on this slide, are hidden. Okay. So you may have me methods that the clock uses to manage itself, but you don't want those seen to the outside world. You might have data that this clock uses to manage itself. And you don't see those from the outside. From the outside, this looks like a working clock that is very simple. It has the ways, ways of setting, ways of getting, but you don't see the internal workings. And that's also important because you want the clock to work if you're a user of the clock, but you don't necessarily want to worry about how it works. You don't have to worry, so it frees you from worrying about how it works as long as the person who created it ensures that it does work and they do their testing and they, they verify that it works. So another, uh, another advantage of compartmentalizing a program this way is that it frees programmers who are working together to focus on their part of the program. It frees them from having to worry about the other parts of the program that they're not working on. Now, if you're working on a program by yourself, then this also works in your favor because when you're working on different parts of the program, sometimes you focus on that part, so you act almost like a separate person than when you worked on another part of the program. So you, if you're able to focus on getting one part of a program to work, once it works, then you don't have to alter it. You can work on a different part of the program. So compartmentalizing not only is a, a tool or a, an approach that allows uh, people to work together in teams, but it also allows you to organize the way you're going to work on a program. So the, the components you create, the objects in an object-oriented system, are determined by the programmer. You, create, you as the programmer will create attributes and methods you create a class and that class is kind of a blueprint or a template for objects. This is important, an important relationship here. The relationship between a class and an object. Because you'll hear me talk about classes and you'll hear me talk about objects. Classes are in your program. Classes are what you define in your program that allow the program to create objects that are used when the program runs. Okay, As programmers, we create classes. We write classes. We write these blueprints in our programs that are used to create objects. So let me give an example of this with this uh, an already familiar um, class that uh, is treated a little bit like a primitive in in Java. But the the string class uh, is a class that allows you to create string objects. The string objects are individual strings, but so those objects are instances of the blueprint of what a string can be. Okay, well, we when we create an object from a class, we call that instantiation. We create an instance of a class, and that instance of a class is an object. So one way to think about this is think about a muffin recipe you've got a recipe to create muffins uh, it's got ingredients the recipe has ingredients and the recipe has instructions okay that's kind of like your class your muffin recipe is like a class so it, the recipe isn't a muffin itself okay in a way then when you go off and you bake muffins using that recipe the muffins might be the objects that are created from that class okay that's just a metaphor, but think about it that way. The programmer creates the instructions and the ingredients, so the attributes and the methods, and then um, the baker 
think about the baker as being like a compiler, it creates the actual objects in the program. Okay, now here's a representation of, um, of a class called insect that two objects have been, been created from. So you've got a class insect and you've created two objects that are insects. They are insect objects, but they are very specific because one is a, a housefly and one is a mosquito. Okay, so you can see that a class is a more general description that you can create specific instances of. Okay. So there's an idea in object-oriented programming that allows more general um, classes to have more specific versions of them created. So um, this process is called inheritance. And it's best illustrated with an example. You can create a class called car that is, uh, let's say the class called car is the description, the template for everything that a car is, everything that any car is. So um, it would be nice if we didn't have to create car from the ground up, if there was a much more general type of class called vehicle that had function functions in it that were relevant, that had methods and data in it that were relevant to vehicles. So if we can inherit some of the structure and functionality from vehicle, we can focus on what makes a car a special type of vehicle. Okay. I'm not going to go into detail about this here except to say that when we have this relationship between uh, a superclass and a subclass, we call vehicle the superclass or the base or parent class, and we call the subclass like car a child class or a derived class. And here's, here's just a, um, a visual representation to help you see this relationship I'm talking about. So you've got a, a vehicle is the parent class here, and you've got a number of child classes that are specific types of vehicles. Um, so imagine that these are classes. A vehicle has certain functionality, but it needs to have child classes in order to have specific functionality for trucks that cars don't need. Jet planes are a vehicle. They're very different from cars, but you, but they share some attributes with cars and trucks. And those attributes they share, they would be getting from vehicle. And you'll see examples of how this works. Okay, and that's the um, description of object-oriented and a review of some of the concepts from the chapter one reading. I hope it was helpful to you. If you have any questions, contact me through the means that have been given to you in the class description or just see me after class.